So uh, I've been around medical students and clinicians for the last 20 years and have uh, gotten to know uh, the religious life of uh, literally hundreds of uh, medical students, residents, and, and attendings. And uh, it's certainly been the case in my own experience as, as a pastor to see that uh, many go into medicine uh, because of their religious background. Now that's certainly not the case for, uh, for all. Uh, in fact, in, in a national survey of medical students, I believe approximately 50% uh, rated themselves as being relatively or moderately spiritual and moderately religious. And uh, because of that, it is probably the case that for many uh, medical students, they go into medicine because, uh, at least in some way, informed by their, their religious background. And uh, faith, in some way, is a motivator for them in going into, uh, into medicine and wanting to care, uh, care for patients. So I'd, I'd like to uh, just start off on more on a personal, uh, kind of a very personal note. And I'd, like, I'd love to hear from the three of you on how has faith shaped uh, a little bit about your background? And, and then especially, in what ways has it informed your going into medicine, uh, your career decisions, yeah, because often these things are so hidden and people aren't, don't have the um, permission to talk about them in, in public. You're taking a risk and just letting us know, uh, and maybe that will be, uh, it will be helpful for others just to hear how that has been informed you. Um, I mean, first of all, I have to thank you very much for the question, because um, after Cami invited me to join the panel, I started to reflect on it, and I would have never thought that my faith influenced my decision to go into medicine. Um, but the more that I, that I thought about it, I think there, there is a connection, and I think it certainly influenced my field in medicine. Um, I grew up in Toronto and Detroit as an Orthodox, modern Orthodox Jew, and that absolutely colored my entire life. So I went to Jewish day school, um, an all-girls school, where the first half of the day you learn only Bible and other religious studies, and then the second half of the day you learn secular studies like math and English. Um, every, every weekend from Friday night when the sun went down till Saturday when the sun went down, we didn't um, write, we didn't draw, we didn't use electronics, we didn't watch TV, we didn't go in cars. Um, and it was a very strict sort of Sabbath experience. And we went to synagogue every single Saturday. And I pretty much memorized all the prayers. That's what you did. Um, and I think it's, the, my faith basically directed my entire life. There's, there was no border between my religious self and my other self. It just all was one. Um, my father is a physician, and I always thought I went into medical practice to emulate him. But the truth is, um, I was actually thinking about medicine or being a rabbi. And in 1986, um, before you guys were born, <laughs> um, you couldn't be a woman Orthodox rabbi in Judaism. So the choice was kind of made for me. Um, but both sort of spoke to me. and. My father was really strug not struggling. He was balancing both. So all those things you can't do on Sabbath, you can do to save a life or to promote health. And I think one of the reasons why many um, Jewish people go into the medical field is because of the huge respect for life and also the body and the sacredness of both. And it it's... There's a lot of um, emphasis on, on how important that is. So he would sometimes walk to the hospital if it was Saturday and his patient was ill. And this part is more unusual, but he would have us sleep over at the hospital when he was on call back when there was overnight call um, because he wanted us to be with him on the Sabbath, but we couldn't travel by car. So I actually did rounds with him on the weekends out of a religious obligation. <laughs> And when we weren't on rounds, my sister and I would sit in the sick, sick kids hospital in Toronto and hope that somebody put on the channel we wanted to watch on television because we couldn't turn the television ourselves. Um, 
by the time I went to medical school, um, I didn't think of it at all as a spiritual choice. Um, when I was in university, that was sort of when I moved a little bit away from my faith, and so it felt like an intellectual choice. But as soon as I got into medical school, and really through residency, it was very disturbing how separate the two were. And I did not feel comfortable um, expressing my faith um, really in medical school or residency. And I'm, sh I'm sure that I am in palliative care because it is the one place within medical practice that I felt I could um, express my spirituality, um, you know, pull out other people's spirituality and talk about things like God and faith, belief and death. Thank you. Your, your story reminds me of, a, we did a study about 20 years ago of physicians' religious characteristics, comparing them to those of the general population using a data set that gave um, accurate population measures. And um, going in, the kind of conventional wisdom was doctors are much less religious than their patients. And that made some sense because doctors are more wealthy on average than their patients and they're more educated. And in the population, People are more educated, more wealthy, tend to be less religious. But it wasn't the case in, at least 20 years ago. In our study, doctors were more or less as religious as the general population. And I suspect there's a lot of, um, that's in part due to um, religious traditions having high views of caring for the sick. And that's certainly true in Christianity. I grew up in a um, very lively evangelical Christian family in, uh, in the southeast where my parents took um, the call to follow Jesus very seriously and invited us to do the same. And around our dinner table, we would, we would talk about all manner of questions. Um, we were a big talkative family, up six siblings. And um, one of those was, though, what are you, you going to do? You know, what, are you gonna, what do you think you want to do with your life? And there was an understanding that whatever you do, you want to make sure that what you do fits within your, vo your primary vocation as a follower of Jesus. And my dad was a physician, my grandfather was a physician, and there was a, I learned early on that caring for the sick was one of those things that Christians through the centuries have thought really dovetails with or is really central to the way, uh, to the church's own vocation in the world, um, that part of that vocation is to attend to those who are sick, those who are disabled, those who are weak, those who are discarded, and care for them. And so I think probably both a desire to do something that was a good job and was intellectually stimulating um, and also that had these, that resonated with the Christian tradition drew me into medicine. I thought I wanted to be a medical um, missionary from biographies I'd read. I was really captured by the witness of some remarkable physicians who'd worked in difficult circumstances caring for the sick. And that's what led me into medicine. Uh, um, uh, first of all, salam alaikum, or peace be upon you, as we say in Arabic. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction and for having me on, on here. Um, very nice meeting this uh, wonderful community. I don't have a disclaimer, I don't have a, a degree on theology, but as a practicing Muslim, I, I hope that I can provide some uh, insights into our view on, on the topic. As for why I chose medicine, um, I think growing up, um, there was there were so many influences um, on, on my decision. Uh, part of it is my family. I have uh, siblings in medicine. But um, uh, from, faith, uh, from faith perspective, uh, I found in medicine two important concepts that converge. Um, uh, one is the concept of um, the, or the value of seeking highly beneficial knowledge. And we can all agree, I hope, that medicine is highly beneficial to oneself and also for the, for the people. And um, that is highlighted in a beautiful hadith or prophetic saying that says, whoever seeks uh, or whoever follows a path in the pursuit of knowledge, Allah or God, will make easy for him a path to paradise just because he uh, had that pursuit. And that the angels lower their wings in approval of the seeker of knowledge. And everything in paradise and on earth uh, prays for the uh, seeker of knowledge, prays for forgiveness for the seeker of knowledge, even the fish in the sea. So that was uh, an important value that, uh, that uh, I learned uh, uh, growing up. But that really encompasses so many other fields, not only medicine. And then the second concept is really what narrowed it down for me to, to medicine, and that is the 
uh, value and significance of saving lives, as mentioned earlier. And that is highlighted in an important uh, verse in the Quran, which we believe is the literal word of God, where Allah says, um, and whoever saves one life, it is as if he had saved the mankind entirely, just saving one life. Uh, so it is a very significant and profound thing to do. Um, and based on these uh, two concepts and other influences, I, I found a career in medicine. Very fulfilling, both uh, spiritually and uh, mentally, to be in medicine. Very happy to be here. I just, I just, I just wanted to say, we have the same line. <laughs> I don't think, uh, yeah, I, I cannot say the source, but yeah. we have the same I, line. I, I'm not surprised Abrahamic religions should have the same uh, concepts, I guess. So uh, there's an old medieval proverb that goes something like, for whenever you have three physicians, there you have two atheists. Um, here we have three physicians, but not, not two atheists, which is interesting. So I guess that proverb is, is not true, and, and data actually does show that that's not the case. Um, Mikhail, your, your story is so integrated of being with your father. Uh, I mean, I've never heard such an integrated story of a single life and, and of, kind of, of having your father model being a physician, and it's just all wrapped up in a single unitary experience. Most people don't experience anything like that, especially once they get onto the wards uh, and uh, faith, religion, even if it was a motivating factor, becomes completely privatized. And it is something where, uh, you know, I've heard one person describe it as when I go, on, uh, when I go into the hospital, um, I put on my physician's hat, and when I go home, I put on my, uh, my hat of faith. And there's two different hats, and I have to wear them in, in this way. This privatization, do, you, uh, do each of you agree with that? Is, is that consistent with your basic experience, um, having gone through training and as, as serving as attendings? Is that your experience? And do you agree with that assumption that these, these two things should remain uh, private or separate, that, you know, that your religious faith, it's fine to not be an atheist, but when you're on the wards, when you're interacting with patients, you better be acting like atheists. What do you think? Um, so I think I mentioned this a little bit. It, it was somewhat painful to feel that you had to hide your faith, and I, I did feel that way. There were plenty of Jewish people when I was in residency in medical school, but none of them um, had, a, had the type of faith in God or observant practice that, that I had. And it felt like something I sort of was not to mention or talk about. And yet I was raised in, you know, there is nothing more important than keeping the Sabbath. So if wherever you go to work or study, they have a problem with that, you just find a different job. <laughs> you know, there's, there's nothing more important than what God commands us to do. Um, I, have, I have made um, adjustments. Um, I'm not quite as observant as my father was in the rules, but um, I still adhere to them. In terms of, so I, I currently practice at the VA, and for whatever reason, I found it an incredibly welcoming place. Part of it is because at this point in my, in my life, I'm in, I'm in charge of a department. But even, even before then, um, my, first, um, my first September at the VA as a palliative care doctor, and palliative care doctors can get away with quite a bit because they're touchy-feely and they're spiritual, which is what I liked about it. I brought a shofar or a ram's horn, which we blow in September to remind us to wake up, to you know, wake up and whatever, wake up and reflect, wake up and uh, repent. And I, I actually blew it in the office, and um, it was. Did it you was, bring it with you tonight? Oh, I'm so sorry. I did not. It's the wrong season. <laughs> um, it just for me it was it was huge that I felt comfortable ex expressing who who I was, but I'm careful because people do sometimes worry if you're a practicing 
uh, Orthodox Jew, how does that affect how you care for your patients? Are there things you wouldn't be comfortable with? And the truth is when I interviewed for fellowship, somebody asked me, how will you manage with dying patients if Judaism feels that life is sacred and that one can't sort of withhold life-sustaining treatments? And I think it's very important for me to say that um, I bring my faith to work in that it's important to me and it gives me strength. I use it when it's helpful to connect with other people and I absolutely never ascribe what I believe on anyone else, be they Jewish or not Jewish. And I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but uh, I think it's very important to, at least for me, I feel like those are not contradic contradictory, that I can have a faith that I have to do certain things, but it doesn't at all influence what you have to do because you have your own beliefs. I, I went to medical school at the University of North Carolina and then three years of residency at the University of Chicago. And uh, along the way, it struck me that no one, no medical educator ever asked us to consider how the substance of Judaism, Christianity, Islam, or any other tradition informs the work we're up to in the practice of medicine. And I always thought that was odd. I still think that's odd. Um, but first of all, just on the historical basis, uh, medicine has received such profound contributions from these communities um, that you really can't understand how we ended up with our, a lot of the assumptions we have today. For example, the assumption that if you're sick, there should be an institution that will take care of you without respect to any other characteristics you have. Um, that's kind of a religious invention. Uh, historically, and so it, I, I never found that satisfying, and um, and certainly as a Christian, it's theologically problematic. I mean, spiritually, fundamentally problematic to think of yourself as having a, a kind of religious self, and then a professional self, or a personal self, and a professional self. I think it's also philosophically incoherent in the end to think of yourself that way. That each of us has to show up as the one thing we are, the one person we are, and. A, according to our best lights, with humility, um, seek to act according, you know, act reasonably, act according to our, fulfilling our obligations to others. And a part of the way we understand what those are, part of the way we understand what medicine is about, um, is in reference to key ideas about what we owe to one another as human beings, what we reasonably hope for, um, what we are, what our future is, that can't be answered, that really these are questions that are answered by religious traditions. And um, so part of my work has been to try to create spaces within academic medicine where we can take those things, take those things seriously. Um, I, I, can, I can relate to both, to be honest. Um, uh, even for an average Muslim physician and an average Muslim individual, uh, it is not possible for us to separate our uh, religion person from our uh, professional person. Um, uh, Islam is is um, is an integral part of our identity. It is not possible for us to leave our identity at the doorstep of, of our workplace uh, and just go to work. Um, uh, because Islam is not only about how, how we perceive God, it is not only about how we worship God, it is also, it is, it is a complete life guide. It tells us how to interact with each other, what is appropriate, what is not, what is not appropriate, what kind of standards I have to have and uphold uh, when I interact with others. Uh, it is a complete, literally a complete life guide. Um, this does not mean that I have or that I am allowed to impose my beliefs and my vision onto others. It just, um, uh, it just is the source of my values that I have to keep in order for me to function as a, a normal um, individual. Well, let me jump ahead to kind of a, the, the topic of this evening. Thank you, all three of you, for sharing, sharing more on the personal side of things. Um, and it, and, it, and it kind of picks up on where we're just leaving off around our topic of death, dying, and what comes next. Um, that's not probably a, a conversation that immediately comes up as you're, as you're caring for patients, even if it's uh, within, within serious illness. I, I think for, to start, for our audience, I'd love for each of you to, as best as you can, briefly as you can, uh, talk about from within your religious tradition uh, what 
what is the belief about your tradition of what comes next after you die? Can you share a little bit about that? Um, so I think it's a mistaken belief um, in Judaism that we don't really believe in an afterlife. I actually had to do a little bit of research, um, which um, is a, it's, it's good because I did, a, I did a good deed by doing that. But in any case, um, the fact that you made me study is, is a wonderful thing. Um, uh, so the belief in an afterlife is a fundamental tenet of Judaism, but it's very unimportant at the same time. Judaism is full of contradictions. The body is holding the soul temporarily for us in this world, and the goal of the soul is to do as much possible good as it can during this lifetime, and it cannot do good afterwards. So it's, it's a missed opportunity once you pass, and when you pass, the soul continues to live and the body gets buried. And we have no idea what that looks like. And the Kabbalah and mystical Judaism um, sort of delves into that, but it's, it's actually not that important to us what happens after. What's important is what happens here, the life you've been given. And it's very similar to what you were saying. There's a guide for every single thing you do up to like which shoe you put on first when you wake up in the morning. It is a guide for how to live your life, some of which is really inconsequential and some of which is life and death stuff. Um, and the whole point is to, is to bring more goodness to this world, um, which may translate into your soul having a better experience after it passes. And then once the soul passes into this other world, which we can't even imagine, it's inconceivable to even think of, um, the people who are still living can continue to do good deeds that will bring that soul even higher because it can no longer do anything. So I, with, the, with the, the, cap, the kind of caveats that all of us are giving that we're not trained theologian, religious scholars, um, yeah. Christians um, profess, believe that um, that humans essentially are embodied uh, embodied beings. That, um, as the as is said in, in the uh, Hebrew scriptures, that God has made us a little lower than the angels, but above the animals, uh, the other animals. We are animals, of course, um, and that we we have that we are all going to die. Um, and that there is going to be, at some point, a resurrection of all the dead to, to judgment and then to life or to, to not life. To, um, and that, uh, that, therefore, the one who is facing death faces death knowing that, that death is the end of this existence they know personally at this point but not the end of their embodied existence, that at the resurrection they will be resurrected as not as angels, but as, uh, and, and there's a mystery about this. Um, we, of course, Christianity is grounded in the, the life, death, and resurrection of this man, Jesus, this Palestinian Jew in the first century who claimed to be the Messiah, and Christians believe he is the Messiah, um, and uh, but that we will be when he rose from the dead, um, he had a body, but it was different in certain respects than other bodies, and that our, ours likewise will be will be different in certain respects. Christians also think about um, Christian tradition affirms that Jesus is going to renew all things. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth, um, and there are ways of talking about that that are that are gestures toward what it'll be like. But we just know it'll be good. We'll be with one another. We'll be with God. And um, it will be the kind of life that we can already begin to taste and experience in relationship with God now. It makes it a lot easier for me to talk after Michal and Far. We share a lot. Um, so, so this is a very big question, and, and it is very important at the same time. It, it really deserves hours of talking. Um, the, the Islamic tradition and in Islam, uh, Islam is really full of uh, knowledge about what happens after we die. And that is just because of how significant this is. Um, uh, it's hard for me to summarize, but let me, let me put it this way. 
there is this life that we're living in uh, that ends with death. And there is the uh, day of judgment, resurrection, and then the, the ultimate life, which is eternal life. And there is another life in between. We call it in Arabic, al-barzakh, which means the interval period in, in English. Uh, this is also another form of life. Uh, our bodies will be buried, but our souls will be in, in, in a position or in a state uh, that resembles um, uh, and that represents our level of faith uh, and our level of, um, uh, of belief in, in God. Um, I can I can tell you about about, about this um, interesting interval period uh, that is kind of alluded into earlier. Um, for example, let's talk about the believer. So the the soul will be in the heavens. Uh, they could be even in the highest levels of heavens with the prophets and with the messengers. Um, the the grave itself would be uh, like a garden for the believer. Uh, it will not be as tight as we perceive. And again, this is a completely different form of life. So we as humans, uh, living humans, we will not be able to perceive that. And um, and we know from uh, prophetic saying, authentic sayings, that there will be a window that will open um, uh, for this dead body to the heaven, and they will see their position in the heaven. Uh, where they will be, and the believer will wish and will be asking God to make a day of judgment even sooner so they can live that life. Um, and there will be opposite stories for the non-believer. Now, what happens on the day of judgment um, is that everyone will be held accountable for their actions. Um, no one can escape their wrongdoings in this life. Eventually, you will face a day of judgment, and, and everyone will be held accountable for that. And then God will decide if someone goes to the heavens and what level of heaven and what they deserve based on what they have done or go to, to, to hell. We, 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 we ask God's refuge from that fate. Now, on what basis someone will end up here or there at the end? I think um, uh, one important and, and significant prophetic saying that explains this, the prophet once said, no one, there is none whose deeds only would entitle them to get into paradise, no one. And then uh, a companion asked him, uh, O Messenger of Allah, not even you. Then he said, not even I, unless Allah wraps, he, wraps me in mercy. Uh, this means that, that all what we're trying to do these days by being believers in Allah or in God, by doing all the good doings that we're, we're trying to do, uh, is that we're trying to uh, 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 make Allah pleased with us. And if he's pleased with us, then he will be merciful with us and he will grant us paradise eventually. Because if you think about it, it is an eternal life that we're looking at. It is heavens. Uh, in heavens, there are things that we have not, we cannot even imagine. So whatever we try to do in this life, we cannot really pay for it. So we need God's mercy eventually to go to paradise. So we live in a death-denying culture. That's an understatement. Most people don't want to think about it. But when they get sick, when they get seriously sick, um, almost to a man or to a woman, they start thinking about these questions. Where am I going when I die? Um, we did a study uh, in Boston around patients who were, had terminally ill cancer, and uh, only 7% seven, seven of Boston cancer patients uh, were comfortably at peace without having any faith at all. Which generally affirms the, the, the saying that there are no atheists in foxholes. There, it's not exactly true. There's at least 7% that are. Uh, but for the most part, most patients, when you're facing a serious illness, you're wondering what's going to happen to me. And, uh, and you're very worried. There's a lot of fear. Uh, many face an existential crisis. They're asking deep questions. A lot of people will either go, uh, go back to their religious tradition or they're starting to search uh, very hastily trying to figure out what's, what they're gonna do. So let's pretend uh, that you have a patient in front of you. Uh, it's a patient you've ju you're just meeting, uh, but they have a terminal illness and, um, and they're dying. And maybe they're dying very soon. Uh, it, could, it could be within a day, it could be days. And they say to you, doctor, uh, and what do I, where am I going? I'm worried, I'm scared. I don't know what's gonna happen to me after I die. And let's say they are um, of a similar tradition. Um, so they're, they're, they're Jewish or they're Christian or they're Muslim. How would you as a physician uh, engage the, this particular patient? Uh, anyone who wants to go first. We don't have to go, we don't have to keep the same order. Well, I mean, I 
I, in a way, my, it'd be perhaps easiest for me because most Americans are Christians, and I, you know, my Jewish and Muslim colleagues have talked to me over the years about the way it's, it's, uh, it's different to be publicly um, Jewish or publicly Muslim when most of your patients are Protestants and Catholic Christians. Um, but for me, most of my patients are Christians. Um, and um, I have, uh, what I would do is have a candid, real conversation with them. What's going on? Tell me, tell me what you're worried about. You, you know, tell me more about, uh, and basically what comes out is their own understanding of who God is and who they are and why they're afraid or, or they're, they're not infrequently struggling with a sense of estrangement from God or the church. Um, and then I, I just um, talk to them like, an, like the reality that I am, which is why I'm, I'm a, you know, happen to be a Christian myself and I never been in your shoes and I can't imagine what it's like. Um, I feel for you given what you're experiencing and also I might say things to encourage them in the ways that I know how um, and that have integrity and that I think are true or ask if there are people they trust, like uh, you might meet, I've had a Catholic patient who's been estranged from the church but is open to meeting with a priest, arrange for them to have that possibility. Um, and out of that, I think at root of that, Michael, is a, is a, is a, a sense, and I know we shared this given what we just said before, that, um, that there's not really anything more important than, than for a person to reckon with God, you know, to, to respond to God, to seek God to, um, to, in the time that they have left. And I don't mean just do something to make sure they go to heaven. I mean, just God is the, the greatest reality, and, and here as they're dying, is there's no time that's where it's more obvious that there's more to their life than just trying to stay alive, much less just trying to be not disturbed in their own set of beliefs. So I would have that kind of candid, open conversation. Okay, just to follow up, so yeah. if, if the, your patient, the patient is Christian, maybe a nominal Christian, and, and they say to you, Dr. Curlin, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid, and I don't know what's going to happen to me. What do I do? What are you going to do? You, you, can, you can refer to a chaplain. I know, we know that. That's, that's yeah. But what do you do if you can't? Well, I mean, I haven't, I've had, I haven't had somebody ask exactly that question, but, I would, I, but I've had people ask similar kinds of questions. Okay. I mean, one thing I would do is say, hey, can I pray with you? And I've never had that. I've never had someone say, in that kind of a context, not say, yes, please. Okay. Um, and then in my praying, I would be basically voicing, giving voice, my own voice to God help us, you know. This is scary. You, you love your beloved son or daughter here who's in this difficult situation. Um, give them eyes to see the truth about who you are and who they are in your sight and, and uh, you know, give them faith um, and have mercy on them and on me and all of us. Um, those kinds of prayers. I mean, I, I'm not reading you a script. I'm just saying yep. I would pray with them. I would sometimes I sometimes I challenge people's ideas. Good. And I'll say, listen, I'm not a, I'm not a pastor, but what you just said, can I can I challenge that? I'll ask him. What? Yeah, sure. What do you mean? Well, I mean, I, I, this is my understanding, and I'll explain it. Okay. So Abdul, the, the you have a patient who's Muslim says to you, I'm afraid. I, I don't know what's going to happen to me. What would be? How would you interact with that patient as as a physician? And yeah, you and you can't refer. I can't refer. No problem. No problem. I, I would not refer them. Uh, so yeah, uh, that that is never happened to me, but I, I can imagine it happening anyways. Uh, so there are two sides to this uh, encounter. First of all, is to uh, explain to them the hopeful side of things in Islam. So as long as there is a soul in the person and they have their ability to repent, there is always a way uh, and a room for repentance uh, until the final breath of the person. They're actually lucky that they know that they are dying, so they have the, the option to repent at that point. Um, uh, so the door for repentance is always open, and Allah, uh, we know from plenty of uh, prophetic sayings and verses in the Quran that Allah uh, is, is most um, um, you know, pleased with, with the person when they repent. 
uh, and there is no number of times that you only can repent for five times or ten times. You can always repent until the last breath of your life. Um, and if you repent, uh, the sincere repentance, then everything that you've done and that you repented from will be wiped. And not only that, if you have, if you turn to Allah uh, the, in the proper way, even your sins will, will, not, will, not, will not only be wiped, but will be replaced by good deeds. Uh, so just imagine you just repent the moment before you die, and then you die on that. Then you will face Allah with a book of good deeds that you have never done in your life. Uh, and this is very well documented in authentic hadiths and, and authentic sayings of the Prophet. So this is the hopeful side of things because the last thing you want to do for a dying person is to shut the door um, and just make them completely hopeless. Um, uh, and the other thing is to try and help them right the wrong because they're usually fearful most of the time because they have done something wrong. Either they did not pray or they did wrong to someone else, they stole money or whatever that is. So you want to help them um, right the wrong, uh, uh, give them the capacity to do, to do it, uh, connect them with people who can help them through it. It depends really on what they're looking into. And just say, what, what is repentance? What does that actually mean in the Muslim, Islamic tra tradition? Yeah. So, so repentance in Islam is... Uh, is and speak to this patient right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's, it's very hard for me to imagine, but let me give you the concept of repentance. Repentance is, is something that is in your heart, uh, is to feel um, uh, guilty of doing what you have done. Uh, there are certain uh, criteria for it. Is to, is for, it has to be sincere and that you plan that you never go back to it in the future. You may go back to it. Everyone can eventually because we, we can't control what's going to happen in the future. But at that very moment, you have to have this sincere uh, feeling that you don't want to go back to it. And then uh, you have to do your best to fix uh, uh, the thing if it is related to any person. So if it is something between you and Allah, for example, you did not pray for the last 10 years, you can't go back and fix that. But if, for example, someone owes me, uh, 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 I owe someone money, then I have to uh, uh, give them the money that, that they have uh, or that I have for them. Um, uh, so these are the, the basic principles of repentance. It can it can happen instantly. It doesn't have. It's not like a process. They don't need me. They don't need any any person as an intermediary person between them and Allah. It's a direct relationship between the Muslim and Allah. Okay. First of all, it's just this is fascinating because I feel like you're talking about my religion, <laughs> um, and that's one of like the lovely things here. There are some real differences and some things that are like word for word. Um, so they say, like, if you have, you know, two rabbis in a room, you'll have three opinions. And one of the things about Judaism is that, I mean, it's true. So there's, there was the... On the other hand. <laughs> there was the Torah from Sinai, which we believe is the true word of God. And then the rabbis had to understand it because it's not, it's not easy to understand what it means. And today, in any country, you get to choose your rabbi. So, and you can be your own rabbi if you want to, but that's a big responsibility. Um, so the first thing I would say to the person is, what, what do you believe? Because um, you can be a practicing Jew and, and believe multiple different things. And the truth is what's important is if that person has a rabbi, what that rabbi interprets the law to be. Um, so I would, very similar to what Far said, I would say, you know, what do you... What are you worried about? What do you believe? What do you think? How did you grow up? Tell me about your traditions. And then maybe ask, is it okay if I um, tell you what I think? But the truth is I'm, I'm not a rabbi. I'm in no position to tell anyone what I think. If they have a rabbi, I will call their rabbi because that's the, old, that's the person who can bring them comfort. Um, and if they don't have a rabbi, I might share what I know, but... I mean, you say we're not allowed to call a chaplain. I probably would. I have prayed with countless Christians at the bedside, but not Jews. It, it hasn't happened to me. And um, I don't know. It, it's, not the same, it's not the same experience. But I, I can tell them what I, what I understand about what Judaism believes about what happens after life. It won't resonate at all if, they, if, they, if it's not part of how they grew up. Okay. And just to clarify, to call the chaplain is, is a good and right thing. I'm not saying, I'm just trying to force you to not to punt 
to someone else and to defer to the to that expert. Uh, but you have to you have to engage it. So let's let's flip the situation. And now the patient is not of your f same faith tradition. Someone uh, and now we're dealing in a you're working in a pluralistic secular hospital. Uh, but that same patient is having an existential crisis. They're um, and they're they're afraid that they uh, of death and what's going to happen to them. How do you navigate that? Uh, of course, you can call the chaplain. I think that's that's probably the probably the first decision point. Is there anything else that you would do? Anyone? I think it's it's similar, right? It's the same. Sitting down, asking if they feel comfortable sharing what they're afraid of, if they feel comfortable sharing what their what their worries are, and then maybe asking them about what they believe. I, I do find the hardest is when someone believes there's just nothingness. Um, it's hard for me to, to comfort that person. Um, if there's just a void after you die, I'm, I'm really not sure what I, what I can say. And, and these are some of the hardest questions. You know, the person who says, I'm afraid of dying because I'm afraid of punishment or I'm afraid of nothingness. Um, and it's, it's actually, um, if, if they are interested in prayer, that is, one of the most sort of rewarding, rewarding things to do. So I don't think it's disingenuous that I've prayed with lots of Christian patients because I tell them that it's coming from a place that we all believe in one God. And, um, and they know I don't believe in that Jesus is God, but I believe in prayer and I believe in sending out um, hopes and thoughts uh, to something bigger, um, and it, it feels somewhat natural to do. I, I think it would be similar likewise in that I'd want to have an honest conversation with them, so, which would include being, being up front about the fact that I'm not, I'm not Jewish or I'm not Muslim. I've, had, I've never had a Jewish patient speak in the way you just described to me. Um, I've had Jewish patients who were distressed about dying and frustrated and sad about it, but not kind of what is God. I haven't had that happen to me. I have had a, a couple of Muslim patients who were uh, just struggling with questions, and and we just talked candidly as a Muslim believer, a Christian believer, who happened to meet because one is sick and one is in a position of being their physician. And... Um, uh, I don't remember the details. I have a, there's a young woman who I have in mind who died of cancer years ago that I took care of for some time. I just remember it was a profoundly, it was profoundly uh, moving experience to be her doctor and watch the way she graciously and faithfully endured her sickness and gave voice to described her her faith as as a Muslim and and we talk and I talked to her as a Christian and we we kind of walk through this together. So I guess the, the takeaway for me is not by being squeamish about the fact that we're from different faiths. I mean, that everybody, everybody who lives in the world recognizes that that's just part of the world. And, and also by seeking to connect and to have a real, to face the reality of, uh, that's on the table. All right. Um, uh, I guess we can call the chaplain now. Uh, so, uh, so I think it really depends on what the patient is asking from me. If they have uh, a specific faith and all they're asking for is some guidance within that faith, they want to talk to someone who understand them, then I think the chaplain would be the best person. Um, it would be a little bit more challenging if they're asking me about my personal view of things and what my religion has to say about it. And uh, I, I'm comfortable with having that conversation, but it, it has to be conducted in a very sensitive and delicate manner uh, because... Uh, I, I will, for example, start by saying that, that I am a Muslim and, and our view of things can be a little bit different than your view of things. And I will let their interests guide the, the conversation. And again, I, I will be talking about, for example, the, the repentance and, and how to turn to Allah and what happens after death and the believer and in the believer and all of that. And, uh, and if they're interested to learn more about my faith, I'm more than happy to do so. The, the, the one important thing that I have to keep in mind as a Muslim, and this is because I am a Muslim, is that 
it's important for us to convey the appropriate message. It's not only about, I know that it's important for us to comfort the individual, but also I don't want to comfort them by giving them the wrong message. And this goes for other things in medicine. For example, if you have a dying person with cancer and you know that they will die in maybe a month or two, it's not appropriate for you to say, oh, it's just a cancer and you will live for 10 years. This is not appropriate. So it's important for me as a Muslim to convey the appropriate message uh, in a very sensitive manner at the same time. So I wanted to add one thing people may or may not know about the Jewish faith. Um, there's no sense that um, it applies to anyone who's not Jewish. So it's it's very easy for me to, um, like I would never even want to explain my worldview to somebody else because it absolutely doesn't apply to them. The hardest person for me to take care of is a Jew because I have a lot of obligations to that person that I will probably ignore in the in the face of autonomy and what's most important to me is what they believe in, not what I believe in, like their rabbi. But I have no obligation to someone who's not Jewish to make them do anything in my coda. I don't know if that makes sense. So I, I can meet them wherever they are and facilitate their own process. And they there's no... There's no sense that you know they the laws don't apply to them. One of the interesting differences is that um, Christianity is an evangelical faith, and so, like my my Jewish colleagues have told me over the years and friends, you know, we're I don't would never think I hope you become Jewish. I mean, like God forbid, <laughs> you don't want to you don't have to you don't want to have to deal with this. It's a burden I'm not going to ask you to bear, exactly. and and then and it's not the same. I mean, for Christians, it's like we'd love for. I'd love for all my Jewish colleagues to know, to know Jesus, um, and all my Muslim colleagues and patients to know Jesus. Um, and I understand Islam similarly to be a, a faith that hopes that all will recognize Allah as as who the Prophet uh, has proclaimed Him to be, and and repent and follow. Um, but we we can believe that I do believe that, and also recognize that in our at least I'll speak as a Christian here, that in the work of attending to those who are sick. Um, uh, I can do that without. I can do that with integrity and with hope and with faith, without needing to use that. I, this is my own conviction. Without needing to use that always as a kind of uh, mechanism of of a chance to to make a convert or to 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 evangelize. It's not that I would ever. I would never be ashamed of talking about Christianity or hesitant to if someone wanted to talk about it. But I also. Um, in the role as a physician, keep my care for their health the the, the, the main thing. I think the the uh, accusation of the medical profession against religion and the role of having any kind of religious role. I mean, far you're kind of bringing it up uh, as far as this evangelistic sort of con uh, coercive sort of spirit. And I think the medical profession as a whole in the United States has said, you know what, this whole conversation, stop it. Do your, you know, do your job, focus on the body, take care of the, the patient in front of you, let other people deal with issues of spirituality and the soul. You should just focus on the material realm. That's what you're trained to do. Don't do anything else. And that's a strong sentiment. I think that even if they don't say it quite so bluntly like I just said it, that seems to really be the sentiment. Uh, and are you, do you believe that you can engage patients in such a way that you're not going to be coercive? Yes, I know, absolutely. I know you're going to say yes, but persuade me why. So the, the, the reality is that there's a power differential. Everybody points that out. It's true. It cannot be escaped. But what, what that, it doesn't follow that because there's a power differential, you shouldn't talk about certain things. Um, what you should do is, is act always with integrity out of a commitment to the patient's good, with respect for them, respect for their, their proper authority. Um, when we encourage people, when we have conversations with people in all of our walks of life, including in medicine, uh, that does not coerce them um, unless we're threatening them, which I would never do. Uh, but when you encourage people to make behavior changes that you think are good for their health, you don't think of yourself as coercing them. You think of yourself as encouraging them. And hopefully you're doing that honestly, in good faith, 
with humility. But sometimes you're, you know, I told, I told you earlier, I might sometimes with a patient say, can I argue with you? I do that not infrequently. And I say it with a smile, and I mean it with a smile. Can I argue with you? That thing you said, I just, you don't want to take that medicine because whatever. I can't just let that rest. Let me argue with you about that. Um, and similarly about spiritual things. I've had arguments with people about their understanding of spiritual matters. Not to twist their arm, but to be honest. It just, I guess, um, I have such a visceral reaction to that question because I, I think it is it, it hits something very real. Um, I, I do feel like as much as my religion speaks to the way I live my entire life, I'm not truly an Orthodox Jew. And my identity as a physician is, is up there with my identity as a Jew. I mean, they're, they're both super big. And I think it would be hard if I, if I had to choose one over the other. Um, there, you don't see Hasidim who are, who are, you know, who are doctors. There's, there's a reason for that. I do think you have to put yourself in the modern world to a certain extent. And I think that people of faith, people who practice, who also go into the medical profession, are not trying to evangelize. They're, they're understanding that the only way to do the good that they're doing is to, I mean, maybe it is to bend the rules a little bit. I'm, I'm not going to tell an Orthodox Jew that they can or cannot do something because I know that's the rule. It would be wholly inappropriate. Um, there are sort of ethical things that we have to that we have to work around, and and at least for me, um, I, I guess I sort of have a modern understanding of my own faith that allows me to do that. There are other jobs I could do that I would never have to question. I mean, I work on Saturday, and unlike my father, I I drive to the hospital, and I decided that was something I was going to do. But if I'm not on call. I don't do that at all. Um, so some of it, it, it's not strict. I can't say that I'm, I'm the strictest, you know, type. Um, but I guess I just, it's it's sort of a little bit painful to think about that someone would think that um, a religious person would go into medicine to evangelize. There are much easier things we could do with our lives. We could preach, you know. <laughs> I didn't mean to say that was easier, but... <laughs> yeah, I, I can, I can um, maybe even go back to the earlier question at the same time when I answer this question. I think while we truly like and would love that every person will become a Muslim, eventually we know that that is not realistic and it will never happen. Uh, we, we know that from the very first day. Um, our role as Muslims in general, Muslim physicians or non-physicians, is to convey the message, is not to convert people. Um, all we need, to, all we have to do, is to convey the message, and as long as the message is is delivered, then that's it. And the person should uh, make their decision uh, whether or not to to follow this religion. And um, it doesn't help either party to force person into a religion or into changing their behavior because it has to be sincere. Uh, there is something in Islam, niya, or the intention. Uh, the intention is the most important thing in everything. Intention can change. Um, or can can give you the credit for doing the good thing, and you could even intend on doing something good, then you end up doing something bad by a mistake, and at the same time you will not be punished be, because of that. So intention is very important in in, in Islam. Um, so that's just kind of to co co go back and cover the the part about uh, uh, discussing a patient who is dying uh, about about religion. Good. Well, I think we can pause here and maybe open it up for uh, questions. I know Cammie's going to walk around with a, a microphone for those who are in the live audience. If you would like to um, ask a question to our uh, panelists, make your question short and, uh, and, and direct. You can either direct it to everyone or to a particular person. Uh, we were going to go into the area of physician aid in dying or physician-assisted suicide, and I'd love for us to go into that direction uh, as well during the Q&A time, but let's, um, let's hear from those who are here in the audience as well as those who are online. You can uh, uh, put in your questions and vote up questions and we'll, we'll engage those as well. My question was just, what was the most profound experience that you've had with the patient um, of your own faith or that was not in, how did it 
shape your opinion of the care that you provide? Um, I can't think of the most. I'm terrible at those kinds of questions, but I think I'll think of someone. Um, I remember a patient who was dying of the effects of alcoholism, and um, he was cared for by his family that he had so terribly wounded um, through, in the years he dealt with alcoholism, he had abandoned his wife, his children had been deeply wounded by them, by him, and yet when he got sick, a couple things happened. One is he finally really repented, and I mean that in the sense that he just was not making any excuses for himself. He was grieve, grievously sort of saying, "I have this is the mess I've made in my life and all the people I've hurt, um, including asking mercy from God. And his family took him in and took care of him and forgave him in a way that was extraordinary. So when I went in as a physician, what I realized there was there was a lot more going on than medicine. And, and this is one of the things about a hospice is you see the way that when people get sick in the modern context, in a lot of ways their, their religious communities lose them to the medical system that seems to call all the shots and maybe let them come in to help them cope, you know, a little bit. But in this case, the person was at home, so he was sort of out of our reach. And there was this profound thing going on of him reckoning with God, reckoning with those he'd hurt, seeking, seeking their forgiveness, preparing himself to die, eyes open. And medicine was like a, um, a handmaid or, a, or a, you know, a helper just to, just to try to help sustain the conditions he needed to be able to do that work before he died. And I think of good hospice medicine, good end-of-life care in that way. I think that's a hard one because there are there are sort of an, a number of different ones. I think there are a couple of times when I've been able, as the palliative care team, to help the rest of the teams in the hospital understand that the the fundamental driver of somebody's choices or um, you know suffering is is sort of a conflict with faith and and a need to profess belief and hope and um, it's it's very it's very difficult when other people don't see that because it's not their their world view um, there is a patient that I took care of that we were having conversations for a, a long time about what they were hoping for and what would a miracle look like and um, how we could help to support that hope and and then I had I actually don't remember the dream anymore. It was a while ago, but I had a dream about the patient, and I shared the dream with the family, and it was just a very intimate and special moment um, that I felt really, um, really privileged to to experience. I think, I think for myself, there are a few um, instances that come to mind. Maybe one would be a dying uh, patient who... Uh, did believe uh, that there is one God, but he did not subscribe to any religion. Um, and what is sad about it is that he, he was like maybe in his 50s or 60s and he had done no search, no research on the topic. Um, uh, I feel like it's important for us to educate ourselves on religion and uh, try and answer these questions while we have health and, and capacity and time. Uh, for that person, I had just to have a conversation with him. It was a, not an easy one for sure. Um, but, but that was the, the one important instance that I can remember. So Joel asks and has four upvotes. Uh, what are your thoughts about medical assistance in dying, particularly with legislation in some countries like Canada, where the ability of medical pr practitioners to perform medical assisted suicide is becoming much more easy? How does this align with the Jewish, Muslim, and Christian view on the sanctity of life? Mm -hmm. So I've already expressed that I'm not maybe like a true, true believer. I mean, I believe in God. I believe in Judaism. I'm, I'm not sure if I believe that the, um, the Jewish Bible is the word of God, literally. Um, that's what Judaism believes. So um, I'm a palliative medicine physician. I take care of people with end-of-life conditions like um, ALS and other neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and I definitely support physician aid in dying. 
Um, it is a complete fiction that we have medicines at our disposal that will ensure that everyone remains comfortable at the end of life. At the same time, that is a personal belief. And I, I, I would not put it on anyone else. And Judaism does not believe in the right for physician aid in dying. The decision about life and death at any point um, is one that only a rabbi can make. And in Judaism, it would be the rabbi and the doctor talking. And again, where you can have some element of autonomy is that you get to pick your rabbi. But there isn't one answer. And in fact, it's so, it's so important and so nuanced that you could never have one answer. So you would have your doctor that knows your condition talk to your rabbi. And that's the only way you would make a decision. But in Judaism strictly, like the most strict orthodox, that decision would never lead to physician aid and dying. It might lead to um, not doing some things that you could do to prolong life. Um, I reconcile that in many ways. One is that um, I think that, um, I mean, it's funny because um, Jews go into medicine because life is sacred. You're supposed to save life. You're allowed to do work on Sabbath to save a life. I go to work on Sabbath to help people die. Um, and I've decided that relieving suffering is just as important as prolonging life if it's done, you know, judiciously and thoughtfully and carefully. Um, and that's sort of how I reconcile that. So for, for me as a Muslim, um, if the question is how to navigate the request really depends on the patient. But uh, if we're asking, if we're talking about what, what the Islamic view on, on medical assistance in dying or made, uh, it is a prohibited. And that is because made violates a very important principle and necessity in Islam, which is the necessity to preserve life. Um, in Islam, there are five necessities um, or principles that all the Islamic ruling and Islamic law uh, serve these necessities eventually. Uh, these are the necessity to preserve life, religion, mind, property, and progeny. Um, and suicide and maid uh, obviously violate the, the, the necessity of preserving life. Now, how to navigate it, it really depends if, if this is a, a Muslim person. It's important for me to explain the Islamic view in a very sensitive and delicate manner. Uh, if this is a Muslim or non-Muslim, and eventually their request to get made in a country that makes this available, like Canada, for example. I'm not sure if it's available here as well and, and how feasible it is. But in Canada, I remember there was uh, a special team that is dedicated for MAID. So even as even I, as, a, as an internist, I cannot uh, provide that care. I will have to involve that team to make the evaluation and make a decision if it is appropriate or not. Obviously, you have to rule out conditions like depression and other things that could clown the decision eventually. In, in Christianity, there obviously in if you, Christ, among Christians, you can find every belief and every activity under the sun. You know from a study you did that a, a large proportion of mainline Protestant denominations, clergy, support medical aid and dying. Am I right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So more, more, but a great, the great majority more do, but a great majority, you know, 80, 70 percent of clergy in the United States do not support it. Okay. Well, I mean. Historically, and, and the if you look at Christian tradition, like I mean, it's inheriting this from what John Paul II described as our elder brothers in the faith, brothers and sisters in the faith, uh, Jewish brothers and sisters. There's a it's quite clear the church has never supported any action which aims at one's death. Um, so it's just sort of a matter of um, uh, I sometimes talked about as a violation of the commandments, not murder. You cannot murder yourself. Sometimes. Just talked about under the 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 emphasis on a, a posture of gratitude and patience under suffering, um, taking Jesus's example as one who um, was not, you know, was patient, trusting the Father to take care of him in, in the midst of his suffering. Um, so there's a lot of folks who support it, but the tradition itself has consistently opposed it. I should say this is one of the things that Jews, Christians, and Muslims have agreed about over the centuries. And in fact, last year there's a there's a joint statement that 
came out with leaders from the Catholic Church, um, Orthodox Jewish rabbis, um, and uh, leading Muslim scholars affirming that we should, uh, of course, sort of speaking with one voice against medical aid and dying. Hi. Um, thank you all so much for your perspectives and your thoughts on this. I think it's, it's very interesting to hear the different ways that you all approach these issues. I'm interested in asking a little bit more about I think the experiences with patients that have really challenged um, your beliefs, your spiritual beliefs, particularly as I, I can speak for myself, like I think being in the hospital, beginning to see suffering, um, very visceral suffering, has been pretty challenging. Um, and I have often found myself walking away from a lot of these interactions, um, questioning a higher being, whether it's God or whoever. Um, about, you know, like, how do we do this work um, and believe in sort of this greater good um, when there are people that genuinely are suffering um, and it's not going to solve, and that there is just natural inequity in how people who become ill relative to those of us that get to live long, healthy lives. Um, so I just wanted to inquire about that. Like, how do you approach those moments where you kind of have to question your faith, or why is this fair, and, and what am I really doing? Um, so I, I'd just like to know about that. That's a great question. I'll be brief. Um, I, I confess that it has, I haven't has struggled with that. I mean, I, I just haven't struggled with the sense of questioning faith in light of suffering. Um, it's interesting to me that the patients I've taken care of who are suffering let me, let me rephrase that. Um, there's lots of folks I've taken care of who are suffering whose, whose question is not, you know, why, how did God let this happen to me, but I'm so grateful for the way that God has been sustaining me through this. Um, and I think it's an, we were talking about this earlier, just the idea that suffering, there's something deeply wrong with suffering, which there clearly is. I mean, we all have sense that this is not right. That itself, I think, reflects an expectation that things should be right and good and just in the world, which kind of reflects a deep sense, I think, that we know that there is a good, that there's a God who, who creates order, has established a moral law that we're not living up to, and that the world itself is sort of fractured and, and, and not really in accord with, um, that makes us long for the day when all will be restored and cry out in the meantime and, and, and lament and so on. But it, it personally it hasn't made me question my faith. I, yeah, it hasn't, it hasn't with me either. I guess even before medicine and before um, I was in the hospital, I think I partly was drawn to medicine because, because it helps with suffering and life is suffering. And we can't begin to understand why. And, I don't believe that one person suffers because they did something bad and they have to repent. Um, it's it's way more complicated than that. Um, I've never thought, you know, if there's suffering in the world, why is God letting it happen? Maybe God created the world and then took a step back and we have free will and we create this mess ourselves. Um, I think more, you know, what little thing can I do today to take a drop of it away? What tiny thing can I do um, to help it just the slightest bit? Um, but somehow the fact, I mean, religion isn't doesn't make sense. Um, it's just something you have or feel or for me at least. So there's suffering and there's God and um, they just exist. They just exist in the world. Oh yeah, you're touching on a very important topic, and it's not um, an infrequently encountered question. Um, I'm not exaggerating to say that there are volumes of books um, that are written to answer this question. It really depends if the person asking this question is a person of faith or a person without a faith. And I can answer in so many different ways, but let me try and and answer it in, in a couple of different ways. First of all. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be beautiful if this life is without suffer, is if everything 
you can just wish whatever you want and you will get it. You will live forever, right? There will be no fighting. There is no, there will be no war. No one dies. No children being killed. Well, you're talking about heaven. You're not talking about this life. So this is one thing. If you really like it to be that way, then uh, I better work for that for that for that life. This is one way um, to answer it. Another way would be. Um, um, all this suffering is, is, is considered a test. This whole life is actually a test. And um, what really distinguishes a good person from, uh, from not a good person is uh, the good person will, will be patient and will use this to return to God, to return to Allah and, re and repent, will be something that draws them back to religion as opposed to pushing them away. The, the person who is without faith or the person who has uh, issues uh, in their integrity, they will, uh, that these suffering will actually push them away from religion. And um, uh, it is mentioned in, in, in a prophetic saying that um, uh, on the day of judgment or in the hereafter, uh, a, a faithful person will be dipped, just a dip in the heaven. And then Allah will ask him, have you ever seen any suffer in life? And he will say, I never. Um, it just tells you that how, how patient, how patience can uh, pay off uh, if, if someone can really be patient. Uh, another way of answering this, and I'm taking too long, is that no matter how you think about it, you can never know what is good and what is bad. It may appear to you that this condition and this disease is bad, but down the road, it can be actually better for that person. And the Quran, if you read, if, if you have time, just go to uh, the chapter called Al-Kahf or the cave. And there is a beautiful story about the prophet uh, Moses and, and uh, a righteous person. And that righteous person was telling Moses, or was, you know, Moses was companioning, uh, was in, com in a company with, with, uh, with the righteous person. And the righteous person was doing things that are uh, clearly evil. Like he would make a hole in, in, um, in, in a ship um, and he will be killing a child. I'm not saying that we're allowed to do this. But down the road, because Allah did reveal to this righteous person and did instruct him and order him to do these things, eventually this righteous person told Moses that I have done these because of these things. This child would have grown up and he would be so terrible to his parents. So Allah wanted to replace his parents with a righteous and a better child and so on and so forth. So uh, these are some ways on how to navigate and how to think about uh, all the the matters that are happening in this life. And there is much more into it. We can talk uh, off, offline if you have time. I think <clears throat> that's a gr I just wanted to also respond to that. It's a very good question. I actually about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I interviewed um, over, I, I can't remember, 50 or 60 HMS students on this very question that, that you're asking. Uh, because I've encountered so many medical students who have had uh, these encounters with suffering, and sometimes it's the very first experience of seeing deep pain and suffering. And what I found, uh, if I can remember the study correctly, what I found was that it is a, for the student themselves, it's, it is an existential question in crisis as they see the suffering in others and how to be around it. And it forces uh, every student to, to say, what do I really believe about this? And, it's, and it, it becomes a watershed in which the student has to say, is what I believe already sufficient in explaining what I'm seeing live in front of me? And, uh, what, I've, and what, I've, I've, uh, what I remember from that study is that the vast majority were forced to go deeper into their belief system and faith and were able to pull out of the resources of that tradition, and most of the uh, I interviewed were Christians, uh, and they, they found, oh, there is a way of actually deeply understanding and being able to be in the presence of suffering, and there's actually a deep theology that explains this in a way that most of us don't have to face until we're in it. I did see a few medical students who left faith because of the suffering, and they felt like there's no, there's no way to explain this, and they lost faith. But I, I did find that most actually found the resources within their own, within the Christian tradition uh, to help explain. But thanks for that question. We, we're, out, we're really yeah. out of time. Can we take one more? And I'm so sorry, but we were thinking of doing it online just to keep it fair and fair. Um, and 
we we're going to ask Christine M's question to round it all off. Have you cared for people who have described near-death experiences or experiences during codes, et cetera, that have confirmed or challenged your own ideas of what might happen to consciousness after death? I've cared for many, many patients who have experienced near-death experiences um, that have given them comfort, almost across the board, give them comfort um, because they feel a sense of light and peace and um, this is, it's a paradox. I both believe that that really happens and also think it might be some sort of neurobiological hypoxia. Um, and um, it does not challenge my belief at all. <laughs> I have to say one thing on this. I, I've not, never encountered such a situation where a patient tells me what they, what they have experienced in, during the code, but I have to say that um, in Islam, we believe that there is the body, but there is also the soul. Uh, the fact that there are no signs of life, this doesn't mean that the soul completely left the body. We know that once the angel of death that is assigned to take that person's life comes down and takes that life, that life will not go back um, in the form that we know it today. Um, so I, I would not even imagine that they will be able to tell me what happens after death, for example, because they're not dead in the, in the meaning of, of Islam. They're dead that there are no signs of living, but not in, in the other meaning. And so maybe I'll, I'll close with this story. Uh, my wife's a physician um, here in the Longwood area, and she works with, in, with palliative patients. And she has had an experience, if I could tell that experience just very briefly. Uh, the patient didn't come back, but this is the, the brief story of what happened. The patient uh, had, uh, I'll call her Mary, she had a, um, a metastatic cancer, and, uh, and Tracy spent uh, one of the, her final nights at the Brigham with, uh, with Mary and her husband. And, uh, and, and Tracy actually um, became very, Tracy and this patient Mary, they became very close. Uh, and they had a, a, a very, yeah, a, a wonderful kind of sisterly, the way she describes it as a sisterly relationship uh, uh, together over the course of, over the course of her treatment. And, uh, but she was dying and uh, Tracy had had this sense uh, that, that Mary was gonna be healed. And, uh, and I can tell you, Tracy had never had that experience before with any of the patients that she's taken care of. Um, at, she, she works at Brigham and, and Dana-Farber. And uh, she had this deep sense that Mary would be healed, even though she had a metastatic cancer and, and medically it was not possible. Uh, on the, the night that Mary and her husband was discharged from the 16th floor at the Brigham, uh, Tracy and Mary said goodbye, and they cried, and um, and they had really kind of a kind of a spiritual care experience. And uh, and Mary went home into in home hospice. Uh, for six weeks passed. Tracy did not have any conversation. Any um, didn't know what happened to Mary. And uh, she was at a conference in San Francisco. Uh, it was uh, I think a Friday night. And all day she had this strong sense that she was supposed to pray for Mary. And she didn't know what was going on with Mary, but she, started, she was praying intensely. She prayed, she felt so intensely that she thought maybe she should call Mary to, to see how she was doing. But then she thought maybe, no, I can't do that, I won't do that. Um, that night, uh, Mary died. Uh, Tracy had a dream of Mary that night. She was sleeping, and um, uh, and she saw uh, she went in the dream. She was back with Mary on the 16th floor of the Brigham, and uh, and out she was about to go into the room in the dream. Mary came through the door, and uh, and and Tracy said she was stunned in the dream as, as she saw Mary. She was incredibly beautiful, more beautiful than any of us, more healthy and robust. And she said that she, in the dream, she had this incredible, uh, incredible gown on and, and she was luminescent and, and there was this peace on her face. Uh, and, and then she woke 
and it was, it, was, it was the break of dawn. And she had no idea what was going on with Mary, and I already gave the, the punchline away. Later that afternoon, uh, her husband emailed Tracy and said, you know, Tracy, I'm sorry to, to let you know that my wife Mary has passed, and she died early this morning. And when this happened, we, there was no way Tracy knew uh, what, uh, what happened with Mary. She had no contact for six weeks. And uh, it, it looks like at the very time that she had this dream was about the very time that Mary died. I don't know, what, what do you make of that? What I believe is that, tr is that God allowed Mary, or God allowed Tracy to see uh, that this strong sense that she had for more, over a year that Mary was going to be healed came true. And she saw Mary completely and totally healed. And um, I don't know how else to explain that story. And I guess with that, we'll close. <laughs>